Good morning, everyone. Good to uh, be together. Uh, good morning to those, or afternoon or evening even, to those who are watching on uh, YouTube. It's uh, great that you've joined us and to be part of the, the Highfield family on this day. Uh, and uh, why is it that we have this time on a Sunday morning? Why is it we have this, this worship time? on a Sunday morning, a time of declaring, a time of singing, a time of prayer, of praise, uh, because we read in the Psalms, God inhabits the praises of his people, that's in Psalm 22. And when we praise God, when we worship the Lord, our creator comes and dwells amongst us. Uh, so as we praise, he is here and we sense him with us. Uh, so what a joy that is to be able to do that. In Psalm 100, we read, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is good. And that is why we are here, to worship a good God who has blessed us in so many ways. And uh, so as we sing our praise this morning, let us just really lift up our praise to the Lord and uh, show him that we really love him and want to worship him. I was smiling just now, thinking about the heat today and the heat this week. Um, I was smiling at uh, my choice of uh, opening song this morning, which is Take Us to the River. <laughs> okay, let's sing that. Take us to the river Take us there in unity to sing The song of your salvation To win this generation for our King The song of your forgiveness For it is with grace that river flows Take us to the river in the city of our God And take us to your throne Give us ears to hear the cry of hell For that cry is mercy Mercy to the fallen sons of men Mercy has triumphed Triumphed over judgment by Take us to the throne room in the city of our God. For the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon us. This is the year of the Lord. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord. Yeah. 
your salvation to win this generation for our King. Song of your forgiveness, for it is with grace that river flows. Take us to the river in the city of our God. Take us to the river in the city of our God. So God inhabits the praises of his people and uh, that is what we're, we're doing now and that's what we're about to do as we uh, have this time of declaration. It's a time of just praising God for who he is, uh, whether it's just saying you are a mighty God, whether it's using the words of something we just sung, whether it's flipping open to Psalms and, and using a line or two out of there, uh, whether it's just saying thank you Lord that you answered my prayer last week. Uh, whatever it is, but it's just declaring the greatness of God. It's just uh, unique that we can bring our own individual praise this morning and corporately come together and worship the Lord. So uh, let's share in this time of, of declaration as uh, we praise our God. Father, Heavenly Father, we thank you that Although you are mighty, although you are uh, above all, you are also right here, right now. And we are in awe of that. But we thank you for it, Lord, because it means that we can know that your presence is in this room. And we can lift up our praise our adoration. We can just honor you this morning, declaring who you are. And it's good to do that at the beginning of a worship service. So Lord, prompt us by your spirit to raise up our voices in honor of you, in the name of Jesus. Put it down there, I should kick it. You know how things go. Let's pray for the word. Father, we thank you for your spirit. We thank you for the tremendous sacrifice that has been done in our place. We thank you, Lord God, for your grace and your mercy which you have bestowed upon us and all the other things that you give us freely all the time. Forgive us, Lord, as we underestimate ourselves and we, we sometimes get lost in our troubles and we, don't, we seem to forget who we are and that we are redeemed and that we have been made righteous and that we are in the authority that you have because we are seated in the heavenly realms with you. So I thank you, Lord God, for your tremendous blessings. So bless this word, bless our communion, bless our fellowship this morning. Amen. I will make the scriptures available that I refer to later on. Um, I can WhatsApp them. I will probably do that, actually, um, because I will probably get through this quite quickly. So... Um, I will be reading from uh, the Jewish Bible, but I will also reference the NIV. <clears throat> so this is John 16, 7 to 11. This is all about the three types of work that the Holy Spirit has to do. Conviction of sin. We know about that one, right? Yeah, 
Africa. I need some response because we have to engage because in the Hebrew synagogues they all gathered around and someone was in the middle, very, very under the spot. But um, so yeah, it's good to engage. So you know, if you want a feedback or tell me that's rubbish, then you know, just just say so. It's important. It's important. We're a fellowship. So John 16, 7 to 11. But I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the comforting counsellor will not come to you. However, if I do go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will show you that the world is wrong about sin, about righteousness, and about judgment. About sin, in that people don't put their trust in me. About righteousness, in that I am going to the Father and you will no longer see me. And about judgment, in that the ruler of this world has been judged. The NIV pretty much says the same. It says the prince of this world now stands condemned. So this is the three conviction works of the Holy Spirit. And they're right there. Sin, righteousness, judgment. Now, as I said, we all know about sin. You have been forgiven, made righteous. But I feel in my personal experience, and I'm being quite candid, that the emphasis on being made righteous does not seem to have been given the same gravity as being forgiven of your sin. Yeah? Yeah, you're all looking at me like... Uh, yeah, so, yeah, it's, it's true. And they're strong words. They are strong words. But before we encountered Christ, we were in a state of sin. But it's easy, easier to understand if we actually know what sin meant. We often associate it with things we do, you know, living in sin or you do a sinful thing. But it's actually a state, something we've inherited all the way from creation, from Adam's fall. So I can tell you a simple story. The word sin is actually one of those words that can't be replaced with anything else because we have nothing else that does the job. And so it's actually an old English word. And there is a story of um, a squire who owns a lot of land. And he's out one morning practicing his archery. And his servant is over there somewhere with a target. You know, they make them out of straw bales. And... Uh, hopefully standing at a safe distance because we don't know how good a shot the squire is. And um, the squire might miss to the left or to the right and sometimes the arrow, so you have to shoot it at an angle and gauge the arc of the arrow. And the arrow might fall 5, 8, 10, 15 feet short of the mark. And the servant would cry out to the squire, Sire, you have sinned. And what it means is, he has fallen short of the mark. Now, there's, I'm going to open up a little something here for you. So I want your spiritual ears to be listening, because I'm just warming up. Okay, it's, it's been a while, but those who have been to Yarrow's Wood would know. Now, yeah, now, now look at this. He's fallen short of the mark, right? The arrow's there, target's there. So... What happens? How does he hit that target? The servant does not move the target. The squire changes his position. Ah, you see? So if you want to hit the target, you have to change your position. Something has to alter. Maybe you should aim differently. Maybe you should change your position. And then you might hit the mark. It's up to you to make the change. Okay? That's brilliant, isn't it? It's so simple. It's so simple. So, it's a default position that we're all born into. And it simply means you're not aware of Christ. The moment you encounter him and the moment you become aware of this state, then Jesus becomes, and this was amazing, you be, he becomes the activator of your spirit. 
He becomes the activator of your spirit. He absolves you of your sinful deeds, resolves the problem of repeating sin, and dissolves your sinful state. How about that? I'll say that again. He absolves you of sinful deeds, resolves the problem of repeating sin, and dissolves the sinful state. And that's why when it's said in churches, the slate has been wiped clean. It's as if nothing happened. Glory to God. Amen. Be happy. Okay, this is, this is just getting going. There's three steps. We're only in step one. But be sure, be sure, because if you are still wrestling and consumed with the whole forgiveness of sin, and it's right to remember why we're here, because it was a sacrifice, but if you haven't got past point one, you're not ready for point two. Point two is righteousness. This is the second work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit now has to convict you that you have been made righteous. And we need convincing because we can't grasp that it's a free gift. When you become forgiven and you have confessed Christ as Savior, he makes you righteous. Amen? It's true. It ought to be easy, but he has to convince us of it. Although it's well-intentioned, it's not uncommon for people to... We slip in the idea that we somehow have to earn the righteousness. We somehow have to work for it. We, some, we somehow have to feel worthy of receiving it. That's actually not right. That, if you look deep in that, that's actually rooted in pride. This is why it's a gift. Because if everyone worked for their righteousness, you're feeding the sinful state, which was birthed from pride. That's the first sin. Right? can't do that it's a free gift it's by grace and grace alone does not that me and Jackie will remember this not by might nor by power but by my spirit says the Lord that's a long way back if you look at Romans 4.3, Abraham put his trust in God and it was credited to his account. This is Abraham, the father of nations. Look what he did. And this was before the, Moses law, the, the Mosaic law was ever published, before the stone tablets. And yet, it was credited to him as righteousness. He didn't work for it. Nothing he did got him the righteousness. All he did was trust God. He had faith in God, and God made him righteousness on that count alone. And it's no different for me and you. When you trust in God, he has made you righteousness. Now, I'm sitting on this. You have to grasp you are Righteous. You see, this is the second work of the Holy Spirit. There's another simple illustration. Imagine, it's like, I, I've, I've seen it in, on my travels, ever since I became a Christian. I've, I've played piano and ministered in various, various places. And there's been people who have met who are doubled over in effort to earn their righteousness or to be righteous. Imagine if this was righteousness was a million pounds. And we're saying to ourselves, I'm, 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 I need to be a millionaire. I so want to be a millionaire. I'm trying hard to be a millionaire. The Holy Spirit is saying, great, 
here's a million pounds. And, but we don't grasp that it's a gift, and so we carry on. Please, I want to be a millionaire. I'm, look, I'm, I'm on my knees. I'm trying so hard. And the spirit says, yeah, yeah. Here's a million pounds. And we still don't get it. And we, we, are, we, are, do, we are making impossible demands on our lives, trying to be righteous. And the spirit saying, yeah, 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 yeah. Here it is. It's given to you. When you accept Christ and you accept his forgiveness and he wipes you of sin, the righteousness comes upon you and it gets better. So, you've been forgiven of your sin. You have been made righteous. So step three is now, it's the toughie, judgment. And judgment is a is a it's a prickly word in church it is in society generally oh we mustn't make judgments well how do you keep order you can't keep order unless you make judgments every pastor knows that he's not judging anyone's soul what he's doing is he's keeping the church disciplined you can't do that if you're not allowed to make judgments there is a spirit in the air out there, my friend. You have to watch out for it. You know, when it comes to church life and your life in faith, it's the word. The word is your plumb line. Measure everything by that. Not everything you hear and see will be out in print in the Bible. But anything you do see and hear must line up with it. That's why the word is called a plumb line. This is the plumb line God kept showing one of the, one of the prophets. I think it was Ezekiel. Now this is interesting. The judges of Israel used to have the power and authority. They ruled. But they could not have that authority of judgment unless they were righteous. Ah! Now you have the key to step three. And that is judge, being able to have dominion, as the, as the, uh, the um, translations give it. How come? Because the same authority that Christ has has been shared with you. You have his authority. That's big. It's a big thing. You cannot have power and dominion over devils and demons if you do not have righteousness and you can't get the righteousness unless you have been there at step one which is the forgiveness of sin because if it could be earned if any suggestion any teaching I don't care if it's from within or without the church if it tells you you can get right by yourself it's a lie because the whole thing is designed to take down the whole importance and the gravity of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. It's trying to, the lie, and you know where they come from, is designed to empty the cross of its power and make this meaningless. Don't ever buy it. Righteousness is a gift. It has to be. And it certainly is. So how do we have dominion? Back in Genesis, verse 1, 28, it says, God blessed them. And God said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it. Rule, that is, have dominion over the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, and every living creature that crawls on the earth. Okay? We have dominion. We have that. There's no mention of powers and principalities. Why? Because the fall hadn't happened yet. But we're talking about God's law. He said, have dominion. And Adam was made in his image, in his likeness. Fall hadn't happened. 
And Adam had the same power and righteousness of God. That's why they could see each other in the garden. That's why when the fall came, God couldn't see him because he was no longer in the light. Ah. Ah, now you say, see? He said, God said, I can't see you. Because in a sense, God is blind to that which is not light. And the moment Adam stepped into darkness, God, I, I can't see you. Obviously, God knew where he was. He was hiding in the bush because Adam was afraid. But God said, I can't see you. Because that covenant, that relationship of life had been broken. Now, in 128, it says, every living thing that rules over the ground. Now, watch this. This is interesting. Two pages forward in Genesis 3.14, Adonai God said to the serpent, who is? Yeah. Because you have done this, in other words, deceived Eve. Now, we know the seed of sin, as we describe it, comes from Adam. Adam was accountable to God because he was responsible for Eve. Eve was deceived, but Adam had to account for it. Okay? Because he had the authority and the power. And to have that, you must have accountability before God. Every judge in the land is accountable to the, to the crown. The police is accountable to the crown. The government is accountable to the crown. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> believe it or not. Because this is all about what is legally yours in God. We're talking, because judgment is a legal term. Judgment is a legal term. And he has secured that righteousness for you legally. What the devil did illegally by deception, that is take it from you, God has given back to you legally. And in doing so, the devil himself is now judged. And not just judged, he's been stripped of everything. He has nothing. He has no hold over you whatsoever. That's why scripture says he moves around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Well, here we are. Why is he looking? We're right here. The reason he can't see you is because if you're covered by the blood, he can't see you. Because we have moved back and redeemed back into the light. Ah, you see? So look at this. He said to Lucifer, for punishment, you will crawl on your belly and eat dust as long as you live. I like that. Eat dirt, devil. <laughs> that's, what said. that's what he said. It's modern language, but not much has changed. But look, he said, you will have dominion over every living creature that crawls on the ground. And then he says to the devil, you will crawl on your belly. So therefore, he has become one of those creatures that crawls on the ground. There is no exception to the first law. Because God never contradicts himself. So when God gave you dominion over every living thing, and that includes the devil because he's now fallen, He's crawling on the ground. He's below your. He's he's under your feet. It's all there. This is why we have him under our heel, because that's where he is. Not by anything we've done, but what has been given to us. We often predispose ourselves sometimes to praying to God, and then expecting Him to do it for us. There are times when divine intervention is needed, where the body cannot actually function. But, we are the body of... And who is the head of the church? Christ. 
So if Christ is the head and you are the body, yeah, try cutting the head off a chicken and seeing how far that gets. It won't know what to do. It's running all over the place, flapping its wings for a bit and it will die. But the head, which is Christ, is joined to his body. The two are joined together. So the authority that the head has is also in the body. You are actually a living example of how this works. See, if Mark's head decides, I'm going to give this person a drink, his body has to engage it. It's no good just thinking it. Yeah? The dynamic of the gospel is to be, not just, he didn't save us just to exist, to be. Go into all, as you go, the Greek dynamic is as you go into the world, preach the good news. Amen? Amen. Be excited. This is, this is you. This is you I'm talking about, and me. I'm preaching to myself as much as I'm saying anything to you. So the authority that exists in the head also exists in the body. Ephesians 2, 5, 7 says that even when we were dead because of our acts of disobedience, he brought us to life along with the Messiah. It is by grace that you have been delivered. That is, God raised us up with the Messiah Yeshua and seated us with him in heaven in order to exhibit in the ages to come how infinitely rich his grace and his great is his kindness towards us who are united with the Messiah. Look how many times the word with comes up. With the Messiah. Raised up with the Messiah. Seated with the Messiah. United with the Messiah. And it's present tense. It's present tense. That is now. So you're saying, how can I be seated in the heavenly realms? I'm here. I'm in Highfield Community Church. Well, in the spirit, (laughs) you're seated in the heavenly realms. And if you're seated on the right hand of God with... Christ, someone's on board. If you're seated in the right, in, um, um, by, uh, by the right hand of God with Christ, you can't have that seat unless you have his righteousness and his authority and his judgment. So you are actually described as the righteousness of Christ. You. That's awesome. Sitting here today in our sweating, wondering when the heat is going to end and when Steve's going to stop, which is not too far, you have the righteousness of God. You are the glory of Christ. You are the glory of Christ. You've been forgiven of your sin. You've been made righteous and you have dominion. You have it. You have not had to earn it. It's not about how long you've been to church. You see, there is nowhere you can go. There is nothing you can do. There is nothing you can say. There is no grave you can visit. There is no homage trip you can pay to anyone or anywhere to get that righteousness and to get that judgment power, that authority. It's given to you so that nobody can boast. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So, closing scripture. Ephesians 1, 18, 23. They're they're grouped together quite well. There is much, much more, but I'm encapsulating this. I pray that he will give light to the eyes of your heart so that you will understand the hope to which he has called you 
What rich glories there are in the inheritance he has promised his people. And how surprisingly great is his power working in us who trust him and have faith in him. It works with the same mighty strength he used when he worked in the Messiah to raise him from the dead and seat him at his right hand in heaven far above every ruler. Every authority, power, dominion, or any other name that can be named, either in the world that is now or the world that is to come. That's interesting. Because it does say, does it not, that when Christ comes we shall rule the earth with him. Does it not? That's why. Because we share his authority and his righteousness. So when Christ comes in power, we're right there. And it will be for a while. He has also put all things under your feet. Remember what it said in Genesis 1.28? He said he has put all things under your feet. And the messianic community, which is us, we are, it says here, verse 23, which is his body, the full expression of him who fills creation. You are his fullest expression. Wow. Isn't that good? It's great. It's great. So really... That's how far I will go with you. But I will say that the word spoken in the power and the authority of Christ is the same whether you're 18 or 80. There is no association or no discrimination with age, colour, type, creed, culture at all. Because the authority remains the same for everybody no matter how far away you are or how further down the line you are and don't underestimate who you are because even the angels are amazed at what has been done in you they are actually amazed not just in you but for you and through you so this what we are going to do the communion we do it in remembrance. I've actually been to a church where they actually toast with the communion. They say, till he comes. And that's what he said. Do this in remembrance of me. We do this. When he comes, this stops. There will be no need to do this because he will be here in glory. And you'll be part of it. You'll be part of it because you have been given equal Right, equal authority, equal dominion and righteousness of Christ. That was achieved on the cross. It was achieved on the cross. The communion is just the beginning of that. So when you partake of communion, have the bread and you have the wine, it's only until he comes and what he has done in you is truly tremendous it's a learning curve for me and I'm going to make a concerted effort to rediscover exactly what has been done in myself we, we all have to do that this is how churches fall asleep we forget that we've been made righteous we forget that we have judgment power and authority we know about it, we hear about it, we sing about it, but that's not the same as revelation. You have to have it revealed in your heart. That's why the Spirit has to convince you and convict you of this righteousness. You are righteous. You can't be loved and made more righteous than you are now. There is no more love or righteousness anywhere in heaven, in cupboards, in jars, in the corner of rooms, there's none of it left. There's no more that can be possibly given to you. 
You have it all. Amen? Amen. You have it all. So take communion, but do it joyfully. This is not a morbid celebration of someone who has been. This is a celebration of someone who is to come. Amen? So we're only doing this for a little while longer, and then he'll be here. So this is celebration. Amen? Amen. Let's make it a celebration. Thank you. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me.
those who believe that Jesus had done that. Those who believe that that's what happened on the cross. Just that. And if you believe that Christ has set you free, then come to remember that. And be thankful. And worship. But I'm also aware in 1 Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 11 is uh, a passage really all about the communion time. And it says there in verse 27, Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, he will be guilty of guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Unworthy? Unworthy? How does that kind of figure? Well, there were people, certainly in Corinth, and I think in our churches today still, where they take communion, well I put it here for show, but I'm not quite sure I mean for show in the sense that you're kind of doing it to say, look at me. But you're doing it to kind of say, yeah, well I'm part of the group here at church. And I'm doing it because everyone else is doing it, and so I, I will take it to show that I'm saved. And that's the wrong reason. Another reason you could be unworthy of taking communion is that this is all about forgiveness. It's all about my forgiveness, your forgiveness. And coming to the table and eating and drinking unworthily would be if you are still not forgiving somebody else. And Jesus talks about that, doesn't he? And I've talked about the story of the unforgiving servant a lot of times. So I'm not going to do it today. But if we come to communion and we share in this, remembering that Christ forgave us and we're still holding a grudge against someone, we're still not forgiving that person, then we are eating and drinking unworthily. We should come to this table with love and forgiveness in our hearts. And so it goes on in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 28. Let a person examine himself or herself. Examine yourself. So to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. In other words, do a little check. You don't just come and go, oh yes, it's communion time, of course I'm going to take communion, I'm a Christian, I'm a believer, and of course I will. And it doesn't matter what's going on in my life. Yes, it does. Then we need to examine ourselves. Why are we partaking of this bread and wine? And is there unforgiveness in our hearts towards someone else that we really need to be sorting out? And so if you are here this morning and you are about to take bread and wine for this communion service and now you're thinking, I'm not sure. That's okay. That's okay. It is better for you to say, no, I'll just leave it this morning. I'll stay here, be part of the service. But I'm not sure, having now examined myself, that it's right to do that at this moment in time. And that's fine, no one's going to judge you here. You are obviously before the Lord, being challenged, and you need to sort a few things out before you come back next month and do it. So I would say, okay, if you want to leave the bread and wine today, because you've examined yourself, and you're going to think, ah, not quite sure I'm right at the moment. That's fine, but we need to take action, so that when we come back next month, in September, and we have communion again, You've sorted that out in your own heart and life. So you become prepared for sharing in the bread and the wine. I found a song last week. If you've been looking on YouTube, you noticed I found a lot of songs. 
um, and been doing a lot of uh, lyric videos, which seem to be quite popular. So and it also puts Highfield on the map, so that helps as well. But it's been good for me, just in my evenings, um, when I was not from around working and so on, I've been looking at and listening to songs and making some videos. And uh, I found this song last week about communion and really touched my heart. And, and having listened to it several times over, when you have to then do the lyric video, you have to listen to it many times over and, and study the words. And uh, I felt this was really right for this morning as we come to communion. So most of you won't know it. Uh, so just listen, look at the words, as I've been doing this week. Uh, if you want to pick up on it and you start singing, that's fine. Uh, that's great. And, uh, and share in that way. So let's just pause, have this, have this song that helps us reflect around the communion table. This is communion. Take up the bread, receive. 
surely had deep meaning to them. And kind of added to that meaning. And before he gave out the bread and the wine, he, he gave thanks. And so let us give thanks this morning for that which these remind us. Father God, you are a God who loves us. And we need to take that in. You know, like God who hates us because we're sinners, and is waiting for us to trip up. You know, like God who wants to harm us because we've not done what we should do this past week. You love us. And you always have loved us. And you always will love us. And out of that love, you sent your one and only Son, Jesus Christ, to forgive, to make a way, to give us access to you forever and ever. And Lord, out of thankfulness and worship, we come to you this morning and share in this meal. 
We thank you for the bread. For it reminds us of a Savior's body. Beaten. Broken. For us. We share in the wine. Remind us of the blood that was shed by the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. Lord, as we share in this bread and this wine, make us truly thankful. Let us take in your love and your forgiveness and bind us together in that love. In the name of his name. Amen. Having given thanks, Jesus then took the bread and he broke it and said, This is my body for you. If you wish to receive the bread, then hold out your hand. As Dave comes round, he will place a piece of bread in your hands for you to eat individually. If you take it, if you eat it, and you give thanks for a wonderful saving. Agreements often have a seal, sometimes a royal seal. And it was a really serious covenant that it was sealed with blood. And Jesus took the cup, it was off the table, around that table at the upper room. And he said, this is the new covenant. And it's with my blood that it's made. It's a covenant of forgiveness. Those who put their trust and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. And so as God's people here this morning, he received the wine. But it is fitting to drink together when we're all served. That we share in that covenant.
loving Heavenly Father we have. What an amazing Savior we have. And as we drink and remember the sacrifice he made, may his spirit minister to us. Father, we do thank you for your love and this opportunity to remember that love. Indeed, minister to us, Lord, by your Spirit. And know that we are children of God, children of the Most High. Amazing grace, God's grace, its sound is truly sweet. It saved us from our sin, from ourselves, from hopelessness. We were once lost, but he sought us like a good shepherd and opened our eyes to his holiness his goodness. His grace made us first tremble in awe and bask in his mercy, knowing that he embraces all who believe. Though our sin is deep, his grace is deeper, wider. We count his grace more precious than gold. From the hour we first believe, until the day we will sing of it in his kingdom and never stop our singing, our praises, our thanks for his unending grace. The sweet sound of amazing grace. God's grace. Steve asked me to do this prayer, my mind went back to a very old communion hymn we used to sing that was in two parts. There was four verses in each part, four before communion and four afterwards. And before our prayer, I'd just like to read the first verse from each part. Hear, O my Lord, I see thee face to face. Here would I touch and handle things unseen. Here grasp with firmer heart hand the eternal grace and all my helplessness on, upon thee lean. Too soon we rise, the symbols disappear. The feast, though not the love, is past and gone. The bread and wine removed, but thou art here, nearer than ever, still my shield and son. Shall we pray? As we recall your great sacrifice for each one of us, we thank you and praise you for giving your life for us. We are part of your church called together in this place. Thank you for all the varying gifts that you have given us, that we may work together in using and sharing them. May we encourage each other in our journeys with you and see you bring forward the way of our church to bring others to you. We pray for all the activities and those who come through these doors this week. May your presence be felt. 
We pray for those in authority, in governments, here and abroad, in the vital decisions they make. And may they look to your ways for answers. Lord, we pray for the power of your word that has and will be preached today. May it be spirit blessed to all who listen. We bring ourselves to you, Lord, here in this building and those at home. And thank you, you know all our thoughts and needs before we are able to say them. Let's just have a time of quiet and let God's love and his healing and his touch just wash over us from top of our head right out to our feet. Lord, we look to you. Thank you, Lord. We praise you that you are sufficient for all our needs. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen.
Jesus saves. And as Steve was saying, uh, Jesus came in Matthew um, saying, All authority in heaven, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. And yes, we remember that promise at Highfield. Every step we take, every place we go, Jesus says, I am with you. In our defeats, in our victories, in our the bad days, in our good days, in our dark days, in our bright days. We can always count on Jesus Christ. Is that right? Amen. Bless you.